we're going to turn towards the book of Ephesians today. Now, the reality is that when you start a new series, it's often kind of hard to figure out how to kind of get it going. So today's a little bit of, um, we're going to take a, an overview of some stuff in it. We're going to take a look at it. And really, um, it, it might be an overview, but it doesn't lack for clarity and for punch in what we're talking about. And we're going to deal with some things today that I think will be revealing for you and for us. Because when, when you look at Ephesians, if I said to you, what's Ephesian? You know, you'd be like, I don't know. The reason it's hard to kind of define Ephesians is because the city of Ephesus no longer exists as it was. The city of Ephesus was a port city, and it was the port was carved out by this river that came down. Around 360 BC the, the, um, or AD, the river silted the port full. So the silt filled the river. The coast was too far away, and people just left the city in droves. So... Um, before they could excavate or uh, dredge it out, the city died, okay? But we need to understand a couple of things about the city of Ephesus. First of all, Ephesus was um, massive, and it was deeply pagan. When, when we think of Ephesus, you're like, what's a modern equivalent? I want you to think of Las Vegas and San Francisco having a love child. A little bit janky, right? A little bit weird. But that's what Ephesus was. Ephesus had the, one of the ancient, seven ancient wonders of the world, the temple to Artemis, which was a Greek god, but they had their tweak on Artemis, and it was the temple actually referred to as the temple of Diana. Diana and this was a deeply prostituted cultish worship. I'm not going to go into that, but just understand it was a grossly pagan, prostituted form of worship, and it was a massive temple. It was a massive temple. One of the, one of the ancient um, uh, poets from Sidon uh, once said that he had seen the hanging gardens of um, Alexandria and the different wonders of the world, and they all fell into the shade of the temple of Diana right? It was just this massive city. They had an amphitheater that sat like 12,000 people. And it was just this huge urban going city. If you put it into a modern American context, we have New York on the West Coast. We have LA on the, on the East Coast. You have New York. On the West Coast, you have LA. And then those are the two largest cities. But what's the other city? Right in the middle, Chicago, right? In, in the Roman Empire, you had Rome, you had Alexandria in Egypt, and you had Ephesus. Ephesus would have been the Chicago of the Roman Empire. It was the third largest city, and it was booming, and it was a busy place. And what we understand back in this time is that as a port city, it had all the weird things going on around the Temple of Diana, Diana and then all of the craziness of things and events and, and behaviors that go on in a port city. So it was a crazy place. And into this madness, into the crazy comes this guy named Paul. Now, you may be wondering, who is Paul? I hear the church talk about this guy named Paul all the time. I mean, I have a friend named Paul. Is it him? What's a, who's Paul, right? Who is Paul? So I want to take a minute and just tell you who Paul is. Paul is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is responsible for writing about two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul was a Hebrew's Hebrew, okay? He was schooled and studied in the Old Testament. He knew the Bible inside and out, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He knew it inside and out, and he was devout in his practices. And he hated the church so much that eventually he was there for the death of Stephen, the first martyr of the church, and he was on his way to... Um, to Damascus in Syria to deliver letters to the high priest there to arrest the Christians who were following Jesus Christ. Paul hated Jesus, he hated the church, and he was ardently against it until on that road to Damascus, a bright light blinded him, knocked him off his donkey, and the next thing you know, he hears a voice and it says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Notice the letter change there. It's Saul before he became Paul. And Paul said, who are you? And he said, the voice, Christ, spoke from the light and said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And at that moment, Paul has a conversion experience and comes to follow Jesus and spends the next few years of his life finding out who Jesus was, growing in his faith, and preparing to be, I kind of see it like God coiled him up and sprung him on the world. Paul becomes the great church planter of the first century. He was all over the map. 
He was everywhere, planting churches, making disciples, and telling everyone he ran into about Jesus Christ. Paul, like I said, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And when we wonder, like, what was Paul like when he did ministry today? We're going to dive into a text out of the book of Acts. And you're like, okay, that's weird, Eric. You said we were doing Ephesians. I did. But the book of Acts actually tells us a bit of what Paul did, a bit, a lot of what Paul did when he was in Ephesus. It's the historical account of it. And you're about to hear one of my favorite Bible stories. All right, this is one of my favorites. I love it. You'll know when we get there. I enjoy this. Uh, listen and uh, follow along as we read. Acts chapter 19, verses 8 to 20. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months. First of all, a Jewish synagogue would have been in Ephesus because there was a dispersion of the Jews after the fall of the temple in 586. A bunch of awesome historical stuff, but we're not going to go into it. So there would have been Jewish people living there. He spoke there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some of them, of the Hebrews, became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even his handkerchief or apron, if it was brought to a sick person, their illness would be cured and the evil spirits left them. Some of the Jews, who if we jump back up, remember, they were obstinate and rejected him, but some of the Jews went around driving out evil spirits and tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. All right, go back real quick if you could. Um, so here's the cool thing. So there's this priest, Sceva is his name, right? And he has seven sons, and they are making, probably making money on going around and doing this, all right? So I want you to have this image. Seven guys, let's make them strapping young lads, and they're going around and they're making money, casting out evil spirits, and doing all these things in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, okay? That's, who they're, that's, that's what they're saying when they get there. This is what happens. One day, the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had an evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, I'm going to be the first person to tell you, I've lost a fight or two in my life. My wife hates that I got in scraps when I was young, but I did. When you have this big of a mouth, you're bound to get in a few fights. And, um, and so, so I love this image. Like, we, we love to take scripture and be like, oh, you know, we read it reverently in a little bit lower tone and all's well. Some people got beat till their clothes came off. <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody get their tail handed to them like that? Like, I've seen a few beat downs, right? I've seen, like, the boxing matches where a guy hits him and the guy's arms go out and he takes a little canvas snap and you're like, oh, oh, oh. you know, that's awesome. But I've never seen someone get hit so hard their pants fall down. <laughs> Not only that, I've never seen one guy take on seven and beat them naked and bleeding. But I would have paid a good king's ransom to watch that. Can you imagine when they're sitting there and they're like, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. And out of this man's mouth says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. And all the while, his eyes are getting a little crazy. And he says, but who are you? And then he shines him up and goes to work. Can you imagine, like, your first brother falls. It's okay, there's six more. By the time five have gone, you're like, I'm a dead man. I'm going to be naked and bleeding. <laughs> naked and bleeding. It's just... I love Bible stories. Okay. <laughs> when this became known, when it became known that the seven sons of Sceva were beaten bloody and naked, the Jews and Greeks in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. They were now taking part in open confession. No quiet confession of the heart. They were openly confessing what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and they burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the scrolls were said to be worth 50,000 drachmas. I don't know the amount of a drachma, but I do know this. It must have been a lot because they mentioned it. They mentioned it as an obscenely large amount of money. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. 
In this way, the word of the Lord spread and grew in power. What we want to talk about today is Ephesians and understand Paul writing it from a prison is writing about the events of Acts 19. Paul's older now. I want you to picture with me this young guy who had been pounding the gospel at the world is now older. He's in the Mamertinian prison in downtown Rome. All right? He would have, if he came up out of the kind of pit that the Mamertinian was, he would come out and he would see the Roman Forum. He'd be able to see the Colosseum off in the distance. He'd be able to see the palaces and the great colonnade that ran for the triumph when they would have a triumph in Rome which was, uh, think of like a North Korean military parade where everybody marches in lockstep and people go crazy and are excited for the power of the general. Julius Caesar would have walked the roads of the Forum in triumph, right? Paul was right there in the heart of Rome in the Mamertinian prison. And Paul writes a letter to the church at Ephesus where he spent two and a half years preaching the gospel and then seeing God come to work. We need to understand this letter to the Ephesians comes with the heart and soul of a man who had been there, a man who loved that church and a man who had not only seen it birthed but participated with God in what he was doing. When we look at this, we have to understand it's a prison letter. And what's amazing about it is this prison letter seems to do the same thing. It tells the story of Paul's life in a way. It tells the story of a radical conversion and a deep repentance and then a call into real living. Do any of you ever feel like you're on this rat race in life and you're, you're getting after it and you're doing things and you're accruing things, you have nice things, whatever it may be, a good job, a steady life and all's well. And you feel like, but is it real? I mean, what am I really doing? And you feel like, yeah, I'm getting all this stuff, but you know at the end of your life, you're, you're not gonna get to take any of it with you. And you wonder, is there value in what I'm doing and what I'm producing, what I'm hoarding, what I'm taking in for myself? Is there real life in who I am. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever have that sense of what I'm doing is all about me and it's missing the greater focus of who it should be about? See, when we look at the book of Ephesians, we look at a book that reminds us of Paul getting knocked off a donkey, a bright light in the Lord speaking, that, that Paul is hurting not just the church, he's hurting Jesus. And then a high calling to the most unworthy of people to participate with God in what he's about to do in bringing the gospel to the world. See, there's, there's conversion. And after that, there's repentance. And after that, there's a real life to be had. And I think for the church right here in this room today, that still holds true. What we have to do is take a look at Paul's life and see what causes a man to write such a letter from such a prison under an emperor like Nero who one day would take Paul's head off as an execution and causes him to be unboundingly joyful in the work God's done in his church despite his circumstances. I love what this shows. Ephesians shows a repentant church, a converted church, and a church living for real within the context of a crazy city on fire for its passions, its lust, and commerce. And we see how long passions, commerce, and lust live. They live until one of them dries up, and the river fills in the harbor, and there's nothing left to live for in this city, right? Right? You can look at this and realize that what happened in Ephesus is supposed to be happening among us. And it's supposed to be speaking to us. Because the book of Ephesians tells us that this is what God has done through Christ. The book of Ephesians, as we wind our way through it over the next couple months, you are going to find out that this, what's going on, is what God has done through Christ. And it's not up to you whether or not you believe it right? If I said, I no longer believe in the sun, that's the son of God with ball of fire in the sky that we see very seldomly but celebrate when we do, right? <laughs> if I no longer believe in that bright, shiny object up there, I no longer believe, and you flew me to Hawaii, which I would greatly appreciate, and you stood me on a beach so that I could proclaim to the world, I no longer believe in the sun, and then you could help me with aloe vera, and different skin treatments to cure the burns for my Michigan white body. Because whether I believe in the sun or not, its effects will be seen quite shortly. 
It's there, whether I believe it or not. And what Paul's saying is this is what happened. This is, this is truth, what God has done in Christ Jesus, whether you believe it or not. But the invitation is yours to take full part in the real life of the church. There's really good news in that. Because Paul is saying, and I believe Paul is saying to the American church right now through his book, his writings in Ephesus, that there are some corrective thoughts to be had in our head about what the church is. The church is not a place for you to get out of hell for free by coming once a week. Ixnay, not true. That is not church. And it needs to be known. What is the thing that Paul taught? That by grace, through faith, you have been saved by Christ, by no works of your own, but by that of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that none should brag. Which means that what Christ has done is the one thing we couldn't do. It was the one thing we couldn't do. We can try every backroom remedy for our soul of religious activity. You can pray in closets. You can pray while jumping. You can, do, you can do all these things in your own power and get nowhere. Think of it like what my dad did when I was in high school. And I love my dad. He's a great guy. But he did something I will never forget. He knelt on a nail. I think I've told this before, but he knelt down on a, knee, on a nail and it went into his knee. He was a construction worker. And I was like, oh! And he got up and he pulled it out with pliers to which I turned super white, kind of gagged and staggered around. And he's like, it's all right. I'll be fine. Wrapped it up as my dad would. Next day he had like a tennis ball living in it. So my dad, being ever medical, <laughs> thank you for getting that, um, gets a clean drywall knife a can of right guard. Yeah, no, no, he did. And he goes into the bathroom because he's going to drain it. Right? Not a kid, chief. Opens it up. Oh, it stings, it burns. That was nothing for the purity of right guard that would now be applied. I don't know why right guard. I thought Chewbacca was in the bathroom. You know, he just, I mean, he raised a cry to heaven. He was in agony. But he's like, it's good. I got it. And you're like, you got something, but I don't think it was it. You know, I, my mom was like, this is disgusting. You know, she was just horrified. A week later, I come home, and my dad's on the couch. I have never seen my dad on the couch in the sunlight before. My, dad's, my dad worked. I mean, the, the, the man worked. And I was like, why is dad laying on the couch with a blanket, shivering? Dad? You know, like, is that you? And he's like, I think I got an infection. We look at his leg, and he looked like Tigger. He had stripes. And I was like, oh, streptococcus, that's bad. <laughs> what is going on? See, my dad did a good intention thing to make himself better, and it made him much worse. My dad had to go get surgery, not for the problem that he had, but for a whole new problem that he caused. And when we do religion, we do much the same thing. We go in and do something thinking this will make Jesus happy. What makes Jesus happy is us believing that the truth of the cross is for us and that we couldn't heal what was broken, but he did. Receive it in grace through faith and come alive and live a real life in the power of Christ. We can no longer pretend that our religious behaviors gets us any closer to heaven than watching football. And as a Broncos fan, it hasn't been heaven, right? It just doesn't get us closer. It's not about the religion. Paul is saying this is what God has done. It is truth. Participate on God's terms. That for you, he did everything necessary to be redeemed. But there's also this reality that we must live with is that for you and I, and we can look in verses 17 to 20 of what it's like when we, well, when we see God at work in the most unlikely circumstances. Remember when the seven sons of Sceva were beaten naked? And then, do you remember what happened afterwards? It's the weirdest thing. After these people were beaten until they were bleeding and naked, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear, the fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom. That's a proverb out of scripture. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. 
How weird of an evangelism story is that? Seven men beaten till they're bloody and naked is the pivot God uses to reveal the truth of God. You cannot manipulate Jesus Christ for your own benefit. You can receive him or not. And when people realize that Jesus Christ was the gospel and not something to profiteer on, they gave of themselves freely and they confessed openly and publicly and at great cost. They burned their scrolls and they ran away from the old life to charge into new life with whom? With Christ. See, what we recognize in this is that Christ will use the most unlikely of circumstances to put himself front and center in the world around us. Our high calling is to participate with God in what he's doing and not manufacture it on our own. The next thing we know is this. We need to let the light get rid of the shadows and quit pretending we can. Ephesians shows us and displays that all the works of humanity, in the end, it's why I believe in total depravity, a reformed tenant. We are completely depraved. It's only Christ that brings life into us. And we need to let the light get rid of the shadows. If you look in verse 13 over here and you look and you understand that when, when we talk about the light getting into the shadows, there's no halfway. There's no halfway to do it. You can't have the parts of Jesus you like and push the other stuff aside. It can't be done. Don't forget the seven sons of Sceva, who some Jews went around driving out evil spirits to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. To those who would say, I'm just going to get out of hell free by going to church would be our equivalent. It doesn't work. It won't be a life that feeds your soul or grows you in Christ. It'll be a life that is frustrated and will leave you bloody, beaten, and naked. Don't discount the full life in Christ that you were called to. If you're a Christian, you were called to this. If you're not a Christian, you're invited to this. But it's your whole life. It is who you are. It can't just be part of it. We can't pick and choose the parts of the gospel that we want to live according to. Ephesians tells us that this is what God has done through Christ. But it also reminds us that we need to let the light of the Holy Spirit shine over our life in desperately inconvenient ways. Ways that ruin our idea of how good we are at this. Ways that put Jesus on the throne in our heart as much as it puts him on the throne in this world. We have to be people who understand that there were different responses when the light shined. On Ephesus. Some people rejected it. Some people manipulated it. And some people came running into it to live. To fully live in the light of the world. As given by Jesus Christ. There are different responses that go on to this. Some will reject it. And I would fully expect leaving church today, some people might say, I'm not doing that again. And I will tell you, it's sad, but that's okay. I'd rather you choose to fully follow Jesus or reject him. Because we as a church understand there are different responses to the gospel, but there is only one response that matters for your eternity and the life you're going to live and the kingdom impact you're going to have. Next thing we know is this. Since we have the same choice, we are called to stand at the precipice and decide how now shall we live with this Jesus Christ changing everything. Changing everything. Jesus doesn't change one or two things. Jesus changes it all. And we, like the Ephesian people, back around 45 AD, had the same choice that they did. Millennia apart, and we're facing the same question. What do we do with Jesus Christ? Does he get all of us, or do we pretend to ourselves that part of us is enough? Part of us isn't enough. The free gift of salvation is an amazing thing. But the high calling of discipleship is a different life entirely. And it brings the kingdom of God to bear on the world around us. So we have the invitation to make the same choice they did. The question is, what will we decide individually? And how will that begin to live for us corporately? Here's what I believe. That the city of Ephesus, so despot, so evil, and so corrupt was something God loved. So there is nothing in this world that God doesn't seek to redeem by the presence of his church in it. You have to live for Christ in the context you're in. You have to become 
one who has not only had the light shined in your life so you can confess the sins that are there and no longer pretend they're not and then be made into his image by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we have to do. We have to stop today and ask the question, do we choose the world or are we gonna let the Holy Spirit have his way in our life? Because when Jesus Christ went to be with the Father, he ascended. He said, I will send to you a counselor, a comforter. And he sent the Holy Spirit that lives in the life of every believer. And the Holy Spirit shines lights inside of us and does a surgery we could scarcely do. Remember my dad who did a terrible job on surgery on himself? So many of us do that religiously. But the only way for him to get well was to go into a true surgeon's office under the bright lights with a skilled technician to deal with the effects of an ill-begotten idea, right? He went in, my dad had great intentions. It worked out poorly. How many of us have had great intentions with Jesus and it's worked out poorly because we thought it was up to us? It's not up to you. Come under the light of the Holy Spirit. Experience today what happened in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. The redemption the conversion, the repentance, and the finally the real life of Christ emerging around. The problem is it takes courage, and courage is only required when fear is present. People act like Christianity is like this easy way out. It's not. It's terrifying to change everything you are to follow a spirit of God that doesn't always feel as tangible as this ugh, sturdy world around us. It takes courage to follow Christ amid the fears of being rejected by the world. It takes courage to be faithful to Jesus Christ when his spirit calls us to do something we don't understand, but we must obey. It takes courage when leadership for a mission trip falters and somebody who's been on one mission trip in their life is handed the baton to lead a team and goes, I can't do it. Great, because we weren't asking you. We were asking the Holy Spirit to lead you through it. It takes courage to live with the Holy Spirit directing who you are. But I will tell you this, it's a life for real. It is a real life. It is a life that echoes generationally down the line. And people will be changed by the life you live. Your life literally echoes into eternity. If it doesn't, then why are we talking about a church 2,000 years ago? Because what happened there is supposed to happen here. The conversion, the repentance, and the real living of the church of Jesus Christ. And we are called to make the choice. Do you want to go under the accurate surgeon's scalpel who can do the work in you that will make your life a living witness for Christ? Or do you choose the world, which will give you religious activities that are akin to bathroom surgery with right guard and a razor blade? You can do your best, but you won't be better afterwards. In the end, we have to make the choice that Paul called the Ephesian church to as much as Paul, through the Spirit of God, is calling the Foundry church to. Who are you going to follow? How now shall we live? Pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for who you are and the work that you do. Thank you for the ways in which your word speaks. God, such a strange story to think that you used the beating of these seven people to start a wave of fear and repentance that led to wisdom and godliness. So Lord, we step back right now and we declare that because of you, Jesus Christ, it is well. It is well in our hearts and souls, not because we have it together, but today we admit we don't. We just don't have it together. God, we're bad at life. We're bad at faith. We're bad at religion. We need you. So come, Holy Spirit, fill your church and turn us loose to live courageously, even if we're a little bit afraid, for the one who died on our behalf. Help us live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us not to be part of some religious backroom behavior that we may think heals us. Help us come under the light of the Holy Spirit that our lives could be changed, not by our own effort, but by recognizing sin, confessing, repenting, and coming alive for real. Oh God, help us as your church to live for real so that in our own confession of it as well, we would not only believe it, but we'd be a living witness of it. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, I'm going to send you out of this place with one clear commission. Go and live for real. Go and live for real in the power of the Holy Spirit that knowing that your life is intended to bring to bear on this world the kingdom of God.
the kingdom of God as lived through the church. And as you do so, it will require great courage because you'll be afraid. But the reality is we're supposed to know God, right? I mean, if my wife calls me, I'm not like, who is this? I know her voice. And I know if she says my name in a certain way, something's wrong. I can see her across the room and see by her gaze something's wrong. The church is the bride of Christ. We are supposed to know Christ that closely. So I invite you to attend to scripture. Don't come to know Jesus as taught by A.W. Tozer or Oswald Chambers or Chuck Swindoll or Eric Folkers or someone else. Come to know Jesus as he is your Lord and Savior, calling you to a life of transformed brilliance to bring the kingdom of God forward. It's not easy, but my friends, it is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun for your life to suddenly be for real and to echo into eternity. Before we close, I'm going to have Jared Plockmeyer come here real quick. Where are you, Jared? Private Jared Plockmeyer just got done with boot camp. Looking good, man. Welcome home. Thank you. I just uh, I wanted to welcome you back and, um, and let your congregation see Jared is serving with the United States Marine Corps. Where are you going to be stationed at? I'm in logistics, so probably North Carolina. Okay, nice. Awesome. North Carolina is where Jared will be serving. I would love for you guys to give him some love, meet him after church, and recognize um, how much we appreciate your service. And I'll tell you this, don't tell my dad I ever said, excuse me, Navy Marines have the best uniform, don't they? It's so good. You look, you look sharp, man. But it's good to have you home. Would you stay up with me? I'm going to do the benediction. Friends, as you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may you go from this place in peace, knowing whose you are and what you're called to be. My friends, the church must leave the building. You're dismissed.